Voice of Call. Far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us. Bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. to the Northland, school to the land of Leif Erikson and his crew, of Harold the Fair-Haired, of Olaf Kriegfusen and many a Viking in rude armor dressed, school to Norway, her fjords and forests, her skalds and sagas, her mountains, her midnight sun, her flashing borealis, Norway, our port of call. It is to Oslo splendid modern capital of Norway that our steamer has brought us. First in commerce, as in population among Norwegian cities, Oslo lies at the head of a picturesque fjord, reaching inward some 50 miles and dotted with innumerable small islands. For many years, Oslo was called Christiania, in honor of the Danish king who rebuilt the original city after the inhabitants had burned it to prevent its being taken by the Swedes. But let us pause and peruse those ancient vellum pages inscribed by Snorre Storlsen that great Icelandic historian of the 12th century who collected these heroic tales, passed on for generations by the skalds or bards of the Northland, and saved for all posterity in the words of Storlason himself. Now it came to pass in the 8th century that King Harold ruled over a part of Norway, and Harold sought the hand of the Lady Giva of Horteland and sent his heralds and messengers across the waters. Three ships have landed, and messengers are at the door, craving audience with you, Lady Giva. Whence do they come? From Norway, they have said. Bid them enter the hall. Fill the horns with mead and let venison be brought. Hail to the Lady Giva. We bid you welcome, strangers. Whence come you? From that King Harold who rules in Norway. King Harold, say you? I had thought Norway had no king, but many chieftains who war among themselves. But King Harold is the greatest and most powerful lord of all. He is the largest of men, the strongest and fairest to look upon. What message is it this king sends to me? He sends you gifts of gold and silks. Much has he heard of your beauty, princess. Why does your lord send these gifts? It is because our king would... Ask your hand in wedlock. Now, in truth, I think your master presumes. My eyes have never beheld this king, Harold. Yet he dares greatly, and that I like. Tell him this is Lady Giva's answer. 
I will not yield myself to any man who has only a few districts to his kingdom. Is there no king in this land who can conquer all Norway as King Eric has conquered Sweden and King Gorm Denmark? Bear these words to your master. Tell him when he is such a ruler as these to come himself in person. Then may I reconsider. Then went the messengers back across the sea in the dragon ships and came to Harold's kingdom, where the chieftain waited in the great hall. What answer do you bring me from the Lady Giva? And what manner of maid is she? Is she as fair as they say? A proud and haughty princess is the Lady Giva, Lord Harold, but comely and with much wisdom. What said she? She... She sent you greetings and thanks for those rich gifts we bore. When we... When we reached Valdris, we were made welcome and there was feasting. But get on, get on. What answer did she give? The Lady Giva has refused your suit. Long did we press for a more favorable answer, telling her of your greatness in this land, your prowess in battle. But she gave us only this message. This is my answer to King Harold. I will promise to become his wife if, for my sake, he shall conquer all Norway and rule as freely as King Eric and King Gorm. Only when he has done this, may he be called King of Norway. Such, then, is the Lady Giva's answer. She speaks bravely. What think you, kinsman Guthorm? Still might this maid be seized by force of arms and men. Not so. The girl has spoken well and deserves thanks instead of injury. She has put a new thought into my mind, which has not come to me before. This I, Harold the King, now solemnly vow and call upon the gods to witness that I shall not cut my hair nor comb my beard until I shall have made myself king of all Norway. If I fail in this, then shall I die in the attempt. Now surely it is spoken like a king, kinsman. Hold fast to thy word. <laughs> Then did good King Harold set forth, and with his knights and berserkers win all the chiefs of Norway as his vassals, making earls each in their region of these proud men. Not till his vow was accomplished did he call to him Reinwald, Earl of Moor, and bid him cut his hair. And all marveled at the king's beauty, and from that day called him Harold the Fair-Haired. Then King Harold journeyed to Hordiland, taking with him a great company as befitted his high rank. And when the proud ships reached the shore, he sent his uncle before him to announce his coming to the Lady Giva. So the princess prepared to receive the king, attiring herself in silks of purple and saffron. And she ordered that all should depart from the hall, and alone eagerly awaited Harold's coming. Harold, king of Norway, by right of conquest. How tall he is, how like a conqueror he bears himself. Welcome, King Harold of Norway. I have done what you dared me try, Lady Giva. Perhaps had you come yourself the first time, I should not have asked for such proofs of your kingship. It is better as it is. But had I known what I now know, I should indeed have come. My hairs did stand justice to your beauty. Often have I seen such blue as your eyes reflect when my ship breasted the sunlit waves. You are such a maiden as the young Viking dreams of as he keeps watch beneath the stars. Nor did those messengers find words worthy of your manhood. Well have they named you the fair-haired king. Never again shall I doubt those tales of your great prowess, the skulls tell. See, I kneel at your feet. I offer you not myself alone, but all my realm. I pray you rise, Harold. Norway is your kingdom, but Giva shall be your queen. Then you will fulfill my promise. I go with you in your ship, and may our going be swift. Now are the gods good to me. Many were the triumphs of Harold the Fairhaired, and long was his reign. Many, too, were his offspring, 
so that for generations to come there was strife in Norway for the throne. Far roamed the Vikings in their predatory ventures, to England, to the Faroe Islands, to France and beyond into the blue Mediterranean, to Greenland and Iceland, and to that far shore which they called Vineland, which was America. But it is modern Norway which most fully captures our fancy and stirs our imagination. For in this relatively small country, during the 19th century, appeared such amazing figures as that virtuoso of the violin, Ole Bull, who was rivaled only by Paganini, the writer and poet Bjorn Stern Bjornsson, the playwright Henrik Ibsen, and the incomparable Edvard Grieg, one of the most beloved of all composers. But newly returned from a triumphal tour of America, Ole Bull goes one afternoon to the home of his friends, the Griegs, parents of the boy Edvard, near Bergen. Oh, but do sit down in this big chair. My husband will return from his walk in a little. We are so eager to hear of your great success. All Norway has been thrilled. And how far you have traveled. Ah, it is an amazing country, that America. But they liked my playing <laughs> and paid well to hear me. But it is of you, my beloved friends, I would talk. How is little Edvard? He is 15 now. Ah, I can scarcely believe it. I have been gone such a long, long while. Does he still make tunes? Does your Edward show promise? I believe the boy is a genius. He has been composing for the piano forte, and his airs have the freshness and charm of our mountains and valleys. Wait. Let me call him. He shall show you his compositions himself. Edward. Oh, Edward? Yes, Mother? Come here to the parlor. I have a great surprise for you. One of your heroes is calling upon us. Yes? But do you not then know who this gentleman is? Not, not Herr Bull. <laughs> you see, we musicians know one another instinctively. Yes, it is the greatest of honors. All of my life I have wanted to see you. Uh, all your life, huh? <laughs> and, and I hear you have turned composer. You study hard, huh? My mother has taught me. She makes me practice for long hours. Oh, he has been most assiduous. But now I can teach him nothing more. He has mastered all that I know. See, here is what he has completed. Mm. 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 It is good, this, eh? Edward should go to Leipzig. Uh, he must study with the great teachers. With Franz Liszt, perhaps. He must know harmony. But, but would those masters have me for a pupil? I shall arrange it. I, uh, Ole Bull. I shall talk with your father. And you must not delay. But remember this always, Edward Gregg. You and I are Norwegians. We must create a great national music. It is the beauties of this Northland, its forest, the tides and the fjords, the sound of the wind in the trees that you must put into your work, the songs of our peasants. the friendship of Franz Liszt, as well as to Ole Bull, the rising Greek was indebted for early appreciation of his genius. He sent a composition to the master of Weimar and received an enthusiastic invitation to visit the great contemporary of Chopin and Wagner. So southward through Germany traveled Grieg to knock at the monastery door where Liszt received the world. see Franz Liszt this gray afternoon. My name is Edvard Grieg. I come from Bergen in Norway. You wrote to me, Master. Oh, uh, but welcome, welcome. Of course I received your sonata. Why, how young you are. Mr. Morton, a boy. And uh, what have you brought me to play? Always they bring Franz Liszt their compositions. Too often they are bad. Uh, bad. But not yours. What I have seen has been splendid. Now, Show me what is under your arm. Oh, Herr List, I regret that I have left my poor pieces in Norway. Oh. I have brought with me only one. Oh. This. Oh, well, let me see it. Let me see it. Ah. Ah, yeah. 
Jawohl, bravo. Oh, sehr schön. I will play this at my next concert. This is the music of the soul. Your soul, Edward Greek. I can hear this in the echoes and re-echoes of your people. It is the soul of Nordland. You see the legends of your country reenacted. The stolid folklore of the Norse. The robust march of your kleiner dwarfs. Your trolls. <laughs> Edvard Grieg's life was blessed by lasting happiness. In the year 1864, he became engaged to his cousin, Nina Hegerup, a singer. And love for her inspired him to set to music those heartfelt lines of Hans Christian Andersen, Jeg elsker dig, I love thee, which all the world still sings. The young wife of the composer had a deep understanding and sympathy for Grieg's works, and together the talented couple gave many concerts in Christiania, Berlin, London, and Paris. Indeed, Grieg was popular in England, so much so that people stood waiting in the street before the doors of the concert hall from early morning. Yet Norway was not content to give one such outstanding genius to the world in a single century. She fathered Bjornstrand Bjornsson, and almost simultaneously, Henrik Ibsen, that incredible dramatist who emerged from an apothecary shop to astound the world with his poetical tragedies, his penetrating satire. In the year 1849, we find the 21-year-old poet in a small chemist shop in Grimstad. Come in. The door's unlatched. Uh, Hendrik, writing again? Is this the proper behavior for a chemist's assistant? <laughs> Here, I want you to meet my friend, Ole Schulold. How do you do? do? <laughs> His father is a new customs officer. This is Hendrik uh, Ibsen. You remember what I told you? He has written a tragedy, and all in three months. <laughs> I have heard in the town that you were a poet. And did they tell you, too, that I was an atheist, a free thinker, perhaps even a revolutionist? Our Henrik here has plenty of friends, but he has enemies, too. But I tell you, Christopher, I am not an enemy of society. I write what I see, what I believe. This Catalina is a drama of revolt. I am going to Christiania soon. If you will permit, I shall take your manuscript of Catalina with me. I shall find the publisher, and I shall interest the directors of a Christiania theater. Come tonight to my room with Christopher here. I shall warm you with punch, then read you my play. Who knows? Perhaps I shan't always remain in a chemist's shop. Till tonight, then. I'll feel the same. At eight. I shall expect you both. Heaven pity you, but you ask to hear the play. <laughs> Never fear. We shall drink to Henrik Ibsen, the Vergeland of Norway, the Holberg, of Grimstad. You shall make our town famous. <laughs> Fame came slowly to Henry Gibson, but it came at last in fullest measure. Catalina was published by friends, but failed to secure favorable comment or production. In a period of poverty, Gibson sold many of the copies to a huckster who found them useful for wrapping paper. It was to the master musician Grieg that Ibsen turned when he sought a typical Norwegian setting for his epic poem of Norwegian character, Per Gynt. Ibsen wrote to the young musician, who approached his great task with the utmost enthusiasm. And when playwright and composer met, the lovely and expressive incidental music was ready. Your play, it is so moving, so significant of our land, that I fear to attempt my task. It is truly a, a profound poem, a work only such a master as yourself could create. And you alone were fitted to compose the music it needs. Your ears are attuned to the true voice of Norway, for austerity and for tenderness. And you understand our peasants, for you have lived among them. You can appreciate both the frailty and the strength of their beauty. But your canvas was so vast, and my, my keyboard seemed so limited. Nevertheless, I, I have tried to capture and mirror the beauty and poetry of what you have written. I ask much. But what I had already heard of your music led me to expect it. I am eager to hear. Perhaps, perhaps you will like best this air. Morning. For into it I have tried to, tried to put the rapture that has often come to me when I watch the morning light break on the mountain tops. <laughs> The 
music was at last heard, it immeasurably enhanced the effectiveness of the production and achieved a measure of popular acclaim that even the play Herr Gint itself was not accorded in Norway. Henrik Ibsen's greatest fame came to him when he had just passed the half-century mark. He began a series of dramas in a manner and with a technique previously undiscovered. These were his great social satires, which, beginning with A Doll's House, revolutionized playwriting and stamped Ibsen as the master dramatist of his century. To George Brandis, the Danish critic, he said in one of their many meetings, No, no, I tell you. I am through with all historical and romantic drama. I have come of age at last. I see a new opportunity, a new responsibility. A playwright, my dear Brands, should be a surgeon. His duty should be to diagnose the disease spots of society and with his scalpel piteously to lay them bare. Let Bjornsson be the poet of the peasants henceforth. I have a larger work to perform. But, Henrik, you are Norway's poet. Who else should recreate her past, write her sagas? No. I am finished with all that. I have come into a new way of thinking. I shall now write a series of social studies. Mm. What do you plan? I have finished a play. A play about a woman. A modern woman and her problems. It is called A Doll's House. And its heroine lives here in Norway. Nora Helmer. This Nora is unhappy, for she is married to a man without sensibilities. And as this play progresses, she discovers she is nothing but a toy, a doll. And in the end, she goes out into the world alone. I have expressed her right to individual self-development, the right every woman should have. I tell you, it is a strong play, a bitter play, but it is the truth. And I do not answer Nora's problem. This, my friend, is life. You shall see. I shall read you the end. But I know well that when this is produced, I shall be a hated man. But I shall be an honest one. Well... I was but your little Skylar, your doll. It was then that it dawned upon me. I was living with a strange man. I see. I see. An abyss has opened between us. But would it not be possible to fill it up? As I am now, I am no wife for you. I have it in me to become a better man. Perhaps. If your doll is taken away from you. But to part from you. No, no, Nora. I cannot understand that idea. That makes it all the more certain that it must be done. Nora. Nora, not now. Goodbye, Torvald. I shall not see the little ones. As I am now, I can be of no use to them. But someday, Nora. Someday. How can I tell? I have no idea what is going to become of me. All over. All over. Nora, shall you never think of me again? I shall think of you often, and of the children, and this house. May I write to you, Nora? No, never. You must not do that. Let me help you if you're in want. No. I can receive nothing from a stranger. Nora, can I never be anything but a stranger to you? Ah, oh, poor old... The most wonderful thing in the world would have to happen. Tell me, what would that be? Both you and I would have to be so changed that... Oh, oh no, Papa. I don't believe any longer in wonderful things happening. But I will believe it. Tell me. So changed that... That our life together would be a real wedlock. No, Nora! Empty. She's gone. The most wonderful thing of all. 
Ibsen's play evoked a storm of protest, as he had expected. He had defied the old conventions of the stage. But with it, he launched his series of attacks on the old and false social standards of Europe. And with each succeeding play, his fame increased and brought added glory to Norway. Summer days in Norway are long and bright as our ship carries up the west coast, where the great fjords from 50 to 100 miles in length reach inland from the sea. Fantastic chasms of indescribable beauty, with steep precipices often more than 2,000 feet high. But winter days are short and dark, for a third of the country is in the latitude of the midnight sun, and the pale borealis flickers on the northern horizon. In this mountainous country are many snowfields and glaciers, parents of tens of thousands of beautiful waterfalls. And as we steam along the coast, visiting Stavanger and Bergen, we store in the treasury of our memory a host of unforgettable pictures of this lovely and varied land, of fishermen on the calm waters of the fjords, of happy, peaceful peasants in the green valleys and on the forest-cloaked mountainside, of church bells at eventide, of voices singing. Skoll to Norway, inspiration for so many of the great of this world, a never-to-be-forgotten port of call for all who visit your shores. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.